All right, well, welcome everyone to our monthly meetup for PNSQC, the Pacific Northwest Software Quality Conference. Uh, this month's meetup is about the pillars of enterprise IT quality with our guest speaker, Ying Ki Kuang, who is also a volunteer for PNSQC and uh, will be our review committee co-chair this year. Um, Yinki, can you see me? Oh, yes. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> okay. So welcome, everyone. So our theme this year is quality coming together for the conference. And quality coming together means quality coming from different areas of the organization, as well as different facets of quality and different components of quality, all, all coming together to form an overall quality perspective for not only the software, but also the organization. Just a little bit about PNSQC. Uh, we are now in our 39th year. We are the longest running software quality conference, I think in the world, but maybe if I wanna think on a smaller local basis uh, in, the, in North America. Um, we focus on uh, looking at software quality from a practitioner point of view and we're an all volunteer conference, which makes us really special and different as well as being nonprofit. Um, our speakers come from all areas of the world and speak about their experiences. They're not consultants talking about anything from ML to um, like what we're discussing today, enterprise quality in, in the organization. We just finished uh, evaluating all the app checks that came in. We had over a hundred of them and sent out notices and we ended up with uh, 23 conference papers, 17 presentations, which is a new aspect of the conference to have presentations without papers. And as normal, we're gonna have some great keynotes and invited talks. <clears throat> so, if you're a speaker at PNSQC, you know about these things. If you're not, we certainly hope that you come in the future and be a speaker, uh, gaining public speaking experiences and also being able to beef up your professional resume. Um, all of the materials that we gather from speakers, both recordings, videos, as well as their papers are stored online forever. So you get to be part of history as well as part of uh, posterity for PNSQC. Um, I'm the host today, uh, just a little bit about me. I'm, I'm the PNSQC program chair. I've been the program chair for three years now. Um, probably most important about me is that I'm a, a cyclist, a traveler and a foodie. I just love uh, eating some great food. Um, our, I'm also a, a speaker at a different many different conferences. Um, but today I'm just the host and I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker. <clears throat> our guest speaker today is Yin Ki Kuang. As I mentioned, he's also a PNSQC volunteer. He's gonna be the review committee chair uh, this year. And he works in the state government uh, doing many things for the state of Oregon, as you can see from the slide there. Um, let's see, he volunteers for local nonprofits, of course, ourselves, as well as others and loves travel. Um, one thing you don't know about Yankee that is not listed here is that he loves to sing karaoke, right, Yankee? <laughs> You're embarrassing me, but uh, I, I only sing uh, a few songs, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just uh, turn it over to you and you can talk about enterprise IT quality. I think most of us think about software quality from the perspective of software developers and testers, but from the user or organization point of view, that's another huge um, aspect of looking at software quality. So I'll let you take it from here. Thanks very much, Yinki, for being here today. Well, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, uh, just like uh, Phil was saying, you know, um, I am not going to be talking about software and IT quality from the point of view of uh, 
developers, uh, but rather from an organization that uh, acquires software and technology to benefit its uh, business operations. So, you know, uh, there are many facets of enterprise IT uh, when kind of uh, expanded to mean the use of technologies for all manner of different vertical industries. Um, the abstracts for today's meetup uh, mention some very big industry verticals. Um, the ones that are the biggest uh, would be like uh, banking and finance. Um, there would be uh, manufacturing, um, retail, and then of course government is also a very big vertical. Um, there are a uh, huge amount of expenditures in IT and I personally believe that uh, the use of IT now is just ubiquitous in almost every industry. So it is very much a core competency of, uh, of every organization to be able to manage its use of uh, IT with good quality. Now, from the point of view of a business that um, uh, put in place information technology and other types of technology, um, they're doing it uh, really with a business case in mind. By business case, we mean, um, you know, uh, the reason you would install uh, a new system uh, or to implement new processes around a new system is basically you may have uh, changes or improvement to your business models. There may even be uh, operational uh, paradigm changes. Um, there are specific business drivers and uh, requirements of the business that uh, necessitate change and necessitate adoption of technology to be more effective and efficient. When considering different solution approach, a business case will typically evaluate the relative cost, benefits, and risks of, um, let's say, a few uh, solution approaches. And the best one with the best price performance, uh, greatest benefits that can be realized for the business, and hopefully with uh, manageable risks um, will end up being selected. And hopefully an organization as part of its business case understand the key success factors and in uh, implementing a new system and working with contractors, um, that it understand what the key success factors are organizationally. Now, um, I am gonna talk about uh, implementation of a solution typically from the point of view of uh, uh, solutions that are based on uh, specific uh, core systems, a base system, if you may. It may be commercial off the shelf or maybe transfer from another organization. Um, it turns out these are the type of solution that many a times are implemented um, for large enterprises. Um, notwithstanding the fact that um, if there's nothing in the marketplace that satisfy one's needs, then you may well be implementing a uh, custom solution as a kind of solution of last resort. Uh, typically that takes on um, much greater technical risk and organizational risk. And that's something an organization would have to manage if you are in a kind of uh, regime where um, there is no good solution out there in the marketplace or from a similar organization that a vendor or a contractor can transfer in for you. Um, in a business case, the most important consideration, although not the, most, not the only important consideration is the cost. And, and by cost, we don't mean just the upfront cost. We also mean the cost associated with uh, ongoing support and maintenance, uh, as well as uh, possibly any technical debt associated with implementing a solution that may not have all the features that you want, or you may have implemented a solution without all the solution that you should have wanted. Here are some select uh, IT uh, system solutions that the state of Oregon has implemented. Um, I just give very ballpark numbers and you can see that there can be some very big ones. You know, the Department of Human Services implemented an integrated eligibility system um, with life cycle costs well over 300 million. Um, the child support system, um, you know, uh, have a value over a hundred million. Yes, Phil. Yeah, I, I just have a question. What does transfer with customization mean? But I also wanted to make a note that to have folks feel, please feel free to raise their hand and ask questions. It's not really a lecture, but 
we hope that get some interaction and, and questions as well. So can you, what does transfer with customization really mean? Transfer system in government or large um, organization context would be that uh, it's a system that might have been implemented for, uh, in the case of state government, maybe for another state, um, typically a state of similar uh, urban rural um, mix in terms of its population um, and also the total population. Those are typically uh, a system that you would transfer uh, a system from. And if you're a major enterprise, say in the oil industry, um, now for proprietary and other reasons, you know, uh, you know, if you're one major oil company, you're not going to be transferring the system from another oil company. But uh, there may be certain uh, base code that by itself doesn't constitute a commercial off-the-shelf products, but are uh, enough of a basic platform on the basis of which solutions can be architected. Um, that type of system are usually referred to as a, a set of software frameworks, for example, uh, is not uncommon for a company to be marketing these basic software uh, components or frameworks uh, for installation in multiple uh, companies. Um, so, so transfer in this context mean uh, you're not starting with uh, uh, no code at all. Right, so actually, so for a transfer then, um, if a organization was going to use COTS, they would just use COTS and have their own customization. So transfer to me seems like it would be a totally customized system transferred from another organization and then customized some more rather than COTS customized and then transferred and then customized more. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and the bifurcation from your code base represent a significant risk for an organization for the uh, ongoing support and maintenance, especially the cost of it. Uh, a transfer by definition is a separate instantiation uh, of the system and um, really um, the ongoing application support and maintenance is uh, going to be a lot more costly than a, a commercial off-the-shelf products where the base features as part of the uh, product function feature has been expanded and then um, maintained and supported uh, as a new version of the product by the uh, vendor supplying that uh, that cost solution, so that's that's a very good point. And um, so, um, so I think the important thing about this chart, besides the fact that large systems can be quite uh, costly, is that um, a lot of time, at least uh, in a state government type context, the largest system are seldom custom. They're usually transfer or they're usually commercial off the shelf. Um, that means that when you implement what may be referred to as the minimal viable product, um, you will have already, uh, you know, your starting point is a very high cost already. And so it is very important to have uh, some fairly good understanding of uh, your requirements. And this type of, um, um, process to capture an organization's uh, desire requirements turn out to be a significant uh, risk um, for implementing any large system. Now, um, once we're talking about a transfer or cut system, um, one of the measure of project complexity would be uh, the gap, you know, meaning the gap of the base system and the gap of your target system. And there are roughly kind of three types of gaps that one need to look at. You know, you have your, um, if you're changing your business model or operating paradigm, that change is going to be uh, very important uh, in determining overall complexity because an organization that is like uh, fundamentally changing its way of operating would inherit a lot of uh, organizational risk. Um, and then, of course, the specific business processes um, would be. Uh, changed um, and those type of things um, have its own uh, challenges both in terms of understanding um, kind of the improved target best practices uh, as well as uh, being able to work with uh, your staff uh, so they're comfortable with the changes involved. Last but not least is of course the technical system itself. The base system may be lacking in certain feature functions um, that you might need in the target system. And that's uh, another types of uh, gap that one would need to analyze.
So, you know, we're saying, you know, it's a cut or transfer with customization. Well, what kind of customization? Uh, roughly speaking, um, you know, you may have uh, specific features function that you would need to develop, but not to be uh, forgotten. And often that's where a lot of risk exists is uh, you may have um, um, a range of existing system, legacy system, possibly even uh, mainframes that are your business of records and you're not gonna get rid of them and you must do uh, either interfaces or integration at a kind of API level or web services kind of level. And then you're gonna have data in the existing system, uh, both uh, system that you're replacing, but also uh, systems that may not exist. I mean, people may be managing data in their spreadsheets um, in kind of uh, desktop tools that somehow have to be all incorporated into the new uh, system environment. So the nature of the technical work um, really is a combination of uh, these days increasingly is a uh, configuration, if there's good um, um, kind of uh, business analyst use configuration tool, that's, um, that's one type of uh, configuration that may exist, but it can also be uh, scripting or actual custom coding of new code. Um, and then, you know, the integration that uh, would be required between uh, the uh, commercial off-the-shelf product that you may be implementing with a range of uh, third-party solutions. Um, and then of course, uh, the in integration with the existing systems. And, um, you know, in considering, uh, you know, these type of thing, uh, one can't have, must take a life cycle view and, and, and you know, uh, when it comes to support and maintenance, for example, if you're really bifurcating from the code base uh, and it's a commercial off-the-shelf products, um, that's something uh, to be very careful about. Uh, in the case of a transfer, you're probably bifurcating anyway. So um, it's, um, you know, part of the nature of the game to, to manage uh, uh, ongoing software upgrades and patching, and then all the different technical environment that you might need in an enterprise. Um, most of the state systems um, and in any large enterprises will have um, you know, you may have a development environment, you may have a testing environment, probably a training environment, and then um, staging and maybe production. You know, the, um, these are all uh, part of the cost of uh, implementing a solution is thinking through uh, how many different environments might be needed. So anyway, back to the life cycle cost, you know, there's the capital cost, which is upfront. Now, increasingly, people are going to SaaS, you know, software as a service. Um, you know, uh, it may seem uh, good to not have a lot of upfront capital costs, uh, but, you know, the downside, of course, is uh, um, you don't have the benefit of a capital uh, expenditures. Um, in government, um, capital expenditures are often funded by bonds, um, you know, kind of uh, um, larger scale uh, financing, uh, financial instruments. Um, in the case of a corporation, you may get a tax write-off associated with capital investment. Um, and, and also in the case of uh, SaaS, you're ultimately paying for uh, um, the upfront costs anyway, uh, just that it's amortized over multiple years uh, as um, to be recovered by the vendor or the contractor as uh, uh, your annual expenditures. Um, and I alluded to earlier that uh, in implementing any system, uh, there's probably gonna be some trade-off um, in terms of what the system can do, what kind of business process and uh, business model it can support. And there may be some uh, non-optimal things that you might have to do. And that, may, that leads to a kind of technical debt that uh, uh, costs you in efficiency and staff time as time goes on. And those should all kind of be factored in as part of your uh, financial model and business uh, analysis uh, when determining um, whether you have a business case or not uh, to implement a specific solution. So I'm going to move on to the uh, second pillar, if you may. Um, and this is uh, in relation to uh, um, understanding. Yes. Did somebody ask a question? Oh, sorry about that. Um, that the choice of the life cycle, you know, um, 
in a way depends on the organization. And um, what I mean by that is um, um, there are different types of uh, projects, um, you know, when folks desire um, organizational change, uh, enterprise level change. Um, you know, I, I list here kind of three important scenarios or the types of projects that people are doing. Um, if one is just optimizing uh, existing workflow and um, is optimizing uh, efficiency, um, probably you're not uh, fundamentally transforming your organization. Um, that being the case, you know, you, um, that the project probably can be managed using any number of life cycle me methodology. And it probably, uh, if, you know, a lot of it just tied to the um, skills of the management and the project manager to bring about uh, a um, solution, you know, at a pace and, um, and a level of comfort that's, uh, that's good for the organization is not as challenging as what I would refer to as a uh, transformative uh, change initiatives, uh, scenario two and three. And among these projects, um, in, you know, we have those projects that are, um, uh, that have known uh, endpoints. You know, you're like transforming your organization, um, maybe based on some sort of a maturity model to achieve a new state of the enterprise that is already rather well known and mapped out from the onset. Uh, but then there are also, especially in a startup, uh, in, a, um, in a space where, um, maybe people are trying to come up with new solution or to disrupt an entire industry. Those then are more like the scenario three type situations where uh, operating paradigms themselves uh, don't necessarily have well understood uh, dominant design or architecture. Those are among the uh, highest risk projects. And, and even in government, um, you know, scenario three projects um, happen from time to time, you know, especially when they're major uh, legislative or regulatory changes. Uh, some of the more recent memory of, uh, you know, these kind of large scale paradigm shift kind of projects would be uh, um, the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, that has to do with uh, the state having to offer um, healthcare insurance uh, for individuals um, um, to buy on a marketplace. That That is a very new and and um, I, I would say, unfortunately, it didn't go very well for many states, including the state of Oregon. So when it comes to talking about the life cycle project, really we're talking about going from um, gathering your requirements, uh, creating a design for your solution, build, deploy, and then operate and optimize the system. Um, what makes it challenging a lot of time is that uh, um, those reverse arrow between build, design, and requirements. That's kind of where the tricky part of things are when you're in the transformative change initiatives is that often the requirements um, are the product of organizational learning and require folks to uh, kind of uh, learn as they do the requirement. And as they do the requirements, uh, that feeds the design and build process. And maybe you have some um, uh, release of code and, and one can then take a look at them and uh, as an organization design if, if the requirements were right in the first place, possibly requiring uh, adjustment to the design or even the architecture. So I think one thing is clear is that uh, traditionally a lot of folks um, focus on the uh, downward part of the arrow, which give rise to the name waterfall. Um, and I think increasingly people are recognizing even with relatively modest sized projects the need to iteratively um, define uh, requirement design and build in sort of an iterative fashion, uh, sort of uh, do as you learn and learn as you do, uh, become an integral part of that process. So I just wanna quickly point out that a lot of folks may think, you know, um, and I've been to many PNSQC talks where I think people think that agile um, is a very important tool to get project done on time and budget. And I don't debate the fact that Agile as an iterative system development lifecycle uh, approach is, is a very valuable part of, uh, um, of any organization and any development organization's uh, toolbox. Now, with that said, you know, I think there are challenges uh, um, 
agile uh, may not work very well for an organization. It's not necessarily because of agile itself, but it's more tied to uh, challenges within specific organizations. Um, with a very large magnitude of change, uh, requirements are likely going to be very volatile because as I say, there's this cycle of uh, learn as you do and then do as you learn. And, and when you have a lot of cross-functional teams uh, in different location, the uh, cross-team uh, coordination become more and more complex. And uh, it may be hard to do that well um, um, with any life cycle methodology, agile including. Um, then you have the um, uh, dependency uh, that has to do with say regulatory standards. It doesn't matter how well-meaning and hardworking a team is, if they don't have the domain expertise on certain types of regulations and the system needs to be compliant with that regulation, then um, it's gonna be a challenge for that organization, no matter what life cycle uh, approach you use. And then of course, uh, some organizations don't have the process and the tool and the governance to support a uh, uh, good iterative development approach. And then last but not least, and I would spend a little bit of time talking about this is, uh, Sometimes you have contracting model that doesn't support iterative or agile well. In key, I had a question. Yes. About that previous slide. Yes. <clears throat> so the, the the chart here, you're saying that um, if the time to delivery is short, then it would benefit from agile, right? Frequently, people look at it that way. That um, you have kind of a tight time frame to do something, and there's not a lot of time to uh, define the requirement very formally and systematically. So, um, with the tight time frame, one is then, uh, you know, kind of agree that uh, we'll define what we can, and then as we develop some of the code and then review, uh, which is really the spirit of iterative and agile development. Uh, so, a lot of time. That is the case, but um, of course, in transformative change of the kind that I was talking about, where an organization may be changing its business architecture or changing its operating paradigm in a fundamental way, uh, whether you have short amount of time or long amount of time, um, there is still the fact that your requirement will remain volatile. And, and, and uh, it's not that waterfall is any better, but, uh, it's just that perhaps I can say even Agile is not going to help you uh, if you have an organization that can't settle on specific requirement because the organization just isn't sure what the requirements are. Okay. It, but it also looks like, so in the chart, it looks like um, novel or innovative uh, projects will benefit from Agile. That's that's what you're saying, or even even in enterprise, it it may not benefit from agile. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think you know um, when people are at the cutting edge of technology, I think uh, the ability to um, learn by trial and error is uh, uh, even more important. Um, and I think in that type of situation. Um, your requirements always almost need to be defined incrementally as you learn more about the technology. Uh, again, it's a variation of the same theme of uh, when you kind of learn as you do and then do as you learn. There is a little bit of um, kind of fundamental need to, to be doing things iteratively. Now, that's not to say, uh, and I'm going to get to that when I talk about contracting model, um, you know, you may still have to have well-defined points where you have something very specific uh, that you deliver uh, against um, fairly well-defined requirements in order for one to be able to assess quality. Um, and I think that's uh, um, kind of the universal challenge for many organizations is to how to balance a, a degree of uh, um, the um, iterative um, definition of your requirements and then kind of do a, a check and make sure that um, it really is meeting business needs and things like that. Yeah, how to appropriately sashimi your requirements. Yes, yes, sashimi Slice is a good them. term yeah. and used a lot in hardware engineering, yes. Um, Thanks. So uh, let me go to the next one. 
So I'll now get to the third pillar. Um, again, it's back to really this fundamental thing about trying to get the requirements correct. Earlier, I referred to the fact that you may uh, have requirements that, you know, um, in with the best of effort and in complete good faith, people capture them. Um, but, you know, as an impassionate uh, observer, if there's such a person, you know, within an organization, one will ultimately have to ask, well, are these requirements reliable? Um, what, um, in the sense of like measurement, um, is there a sense in which these uh, requirements, even though they were gathered carefully, uh, may be off in some sense? And to that, I would point out that, you know, perhaps your requirement is just as good as your subject matter experts. Um, by that, I mean, a lot of time when you do requirement gathering and you have uh, work sessions, um, your best subject matter experts, they, they may be vital to their business organization and they may not actually be participating uh, in your work sessions uh, in a large enterprise. Um, and for those that do participate and have good expertise, a lot of time they may be relatively uh, unskilled in understanding um, this, uh, the, you know, kind of the cost and the risk associated with uh, uh, customizing a base system and versus the benefit that they would uh, garner by having customization. Uh, that is made more complicated by the fact that a lot of your subject matter experts are fundamentally experts of the ASIS business process. They don't really have a good um, uh, experience or expertise with, with the target new business process of the new system and the best practices that perhaps is latent uh, in or embedded in the new system. And that being the case, um, you know, you have the limitation of the experts that, um, you know, is kind of a combination of they don't know what they don't know. And also that uh, what they prefer uh, may not necessarily be in the uh, best interest of a transformative change initiative. Um, and that may color their objectivity uh, in some way, uh, introducing kind of a group biases. Um, now, the, the next part that's kind of maybe more prevalent in large organization is the people stand to participate uh, in these uh, work sessions to define requirements. Uh, they may well not be fully empowered uh, in the sense that uh, uh, everything that they propose may still need to be uh, kind of checked in with the management. Um, you know, I think one of the paradigm uh, and an assumption behind Agile is that you have well-meaning people coming together to do good work together and there's kind of an implicit assumption that they are empowered to propose the kind of uh, changes and suggestions uh, that um, kind of enable the organization to, uh, to make the most productive change. Uh, now, whether that's true in practice or not, of course, depends on the organization culture, the dynamics of the people working together, and then ultimately the experience and the uh, uh, level of expertise of the uh, subject matter experts. And then this other point, um, okay, you capture the requirements, maybe people are empowered, um, uh, people are trying their best, but is there a sense in which the requirement you have, you've captured can in fact be stable? If you have um, a normal project, uh, then the answer chances, uh, what I was referring to as a kind of incremental change of an enterprise uh, through business uh, process optimization, um, I think those are more likely to uh, have kind of stable enterprise architecture and these dominant design. And, and there may be even maturity model to guide you to get you from where you are to where you want to end up. And um, then it's just like, almost like a formal project management and system engineering exercise. Um, those I would say are the easier projects. The hard part is when you have an organization paradigm change uh, now you are kind of evolving your enterprise architecture, uh, may not have a dominant design and no maturity model to guide you. Um, and, and then your business case always have a degree of uncertainty uh, and your requirement may, may be kind of unstable um, uh, until people kind of develop the uh, 
uh, the organization uh, consensus or the teamwork to uh, start becoming more comfortable that they're that's where they want to go, uh, and and that. Uh, um, but until you get there, you know, the, the project triangle uh, in terms of your scope, uh, timeline, and uh, budget uh, could be in a state of uh, flux and uncertainty, making it difficult for you to say, um, "Well, I got my requirements," but you know, maybe a month later, some of those things necessarily may need to change because. Uh, business conditions may have changed or people start uh, having learned more, understand that maybe their previous views were uh, kind of uh, needing improvement. So this is kind of a graphics that I like to show, you know, uh, a paradigm shift is almost like going from the left fishbowl to the right fishbowl. Uh, there may be many paths that you can get uh, from one fishbowl to the next and um, if you're lucky, you know, you get a good path. If you're unlucky, maybe you still get into the fishbowl, but maybe through a less optimal path, it may take longer, may take more effort. Uh, but there's a really a, a much kind of worst case scenario is that you rock the organization in a way and may have captured requirements that are not so good and using processes that um, maybe not very effective for the organization, you can end up not in the fishbowl at all. So then where are you going to end up? I mean, you maybe end up in a worse state. So, so these are among the consideration um, in considering uh, requirements is to kind of almost a need in transformative change initiative to question um, the validity of your uh, requirement, uh, the accuracy of your requirements, and then for the path that you have chosen, um, you know, whether uh, you're off course uh, and even worse, you may be on the wrong course. And then when come to the target, it's great if you know what fishbowl you're gonna end up and, and just where it is and how big it is and the water is clear. Uh, and uh, the worst case is uh, you don't quite know where this fishbowl really is and the condition of, the, of your target. All right, I'm moving on to the next uh, pillar here. Um, uh, and I like kind of say the distinction between uh, the quality of the project delivery versus the quality of the work product. What do I mean by that? And some of you may have seen this graphics from uh, uh, that uh, workshop that Phil was referring to that uh, PNSQC uh, kindly uh, came down to Salem to deliver it to some 70 state staff. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, this middle text here, I mean, for those of us that have seen many large enterprise projects uh, in large organization, your contract have a tendency to produce a status report that want to convey that uh, we got the detailed requirements captured, um, the project is currently tracking on time on budget, um, we got adequate resources and we are controlling scope creep. These are kind of classically what people want to hear. Unfortunately, as this kind of cartoon on the top here depicts, and here's a guy kind of mowing, uh, mowing something and, uh, and, you know, he wanted to get rid of the, of the weeds and, uh, and he's saying to himself, well, I'm really going to get rid of the weeds now. Well, of course, the problem here is he's not only getting rid, rid of the weeds, he's also getting rid of all the nice things in the garden. Um, so, you know, your contractor kind of uh, might have a way to uh, convey a very positive spin on the project that they're doing. Um, um, but we really need to have some careful checking, frequent checking as to what are the path that you're on really meet business needs. Here's kind of a quick summarization of, uh, you know, the contractor's motivation is rather different than the organization acquiring an IT solution. Uh, obviously your contractor's main goal all said and done is they want to maximize their profit. Um, you know, their business need is, uh, it really doesn't matter what they implement, uh, just as long as they can do it uh, within the, 
projected costs. And um, when it comes to data conversion, they'll be very happy to do it for you uh, as many times as you want. Uh, you know, they will just end up uh, charging you for it. Um, then when it come to um, testing, you know, um, you know, we, we want to see uh, system integration testing and, and if the total solution involve integration or interfaces with legacy system, probably you want to be sure that uh, they have done that type of testing before they turn over uh, to the organization for user acceptance testing. And then, you know, when you're doing the testing for uh, security and other reason, um, you don't want the contractor to tell you, well, why don't we just use operating operational data to test the system? You know, the, the, the problem with that, of course, is you'll be exposing uh, maybe uh, personal identifiable information uh, data to, to people that really don't have a need to see. Um, so, you know, I think, and then, you know, last but not least is the contractor of a, a kind of a conflict and interest when it comes to uh, classifying uh, the level of a specific defects. I mean, most contract would call for kind of level one defects or level two defects to be fixed. And if they don't fix, then you're not gonna get acceptance. Um, so, you know, often you may have uh, defects that are uh, pretty severe and a contractor would have a tendency to classify them at a lower severity levels, you know. So, so these are all kind of go back to the idea that uh, the contractor care first and foremost uh, to get done on a project uh, on time and on budget from their point of view, meaning that they will end up uh, with a good uh, profit margin. So, you know, when one do a contract, um, one needs to be especially careful uh, when it comes to things like acceptance criteria, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, understanding whether um, there's, really sufficient time and the ability to iterate around um, the refinement of user stories, use cases, um, the functional requirement definition, things of that sort. Um, is one thing to be using Agile for your developers is another thing for the acquiring organization to say, hey, you know, just what requirements are you building on? And can we kind of like check them out to make sure they meet our business needs? Um, I think developing organization has a, a conflict of interest when it comes to uh, getting the requirement specified uh, in a clear enough way that it can be subjected to uh, an organization's uh, review, sometimes by an independent third-party contractor. And, and I think that um, present a kind of uh, working challenge um, with any contractor that, uh, you know, do you have the kind of contracting model that actually support uh, iterations, uh, support your sprints in a meaningful way? So um, there's still room within the contract to make necessary adjustment to your user story, use cases, and things like that. Here's a slide. Um, of the, yes. In, uh, Jack had a question that he put into chat as a, <laughs> As a contractor, does it make sense to do poor testing in order to avoid rework? Yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, that's a big challenge for the state. Um, you have contractor that uh, um, is their is their interest to uh, say the system development work is done and is now in a state that's suitable for the state to do acceptance testing. Um, now, I think any large organization would understand that if the system is of low quality, then it really is a waste of the organization's time to conduct acceptance testing because you'll find a lot of defects, a lot of bugs. So, you know, this actually segue well into this slide. You know, if, if your contracting model is on the top, which is waterfall, which means you have a specific points in time where you look at the requirements, specific point in time you look at the design, and then at some point you get a system um, for acceptance testing. Any defects in requirement design uh, will be discovered very late and maybe very costly to, to fix. I mean, that's a well-known benefit of doing iterative. Now, 
With that said, if your contracting model does not in fact enable test points after specific uh, sprints or number of iterations, and you actually do conscientious uh, objective testing of um, features versus uh, the stated requirements, then even though your contractor may be doing iterative from the organization standpoint, it's still almost like the top diagram because you don't have specific intermediate deliverables against which you do uh, careful objective testing. So, so yes, uh, to Jack's uh, question and point, is very likely um, that your contractor would want uh, the, uh, the organization acquiring the system to enter into user acceptance testing as early as possible, and then um, as much as possible classify the, um, the defects as, as low severity and you know, in the hope of getting uh, to uh, acceptance by the organization as uh, early as possible. And those are the things that one must uh, manage very carefully. Yes, Bushan. I just wanted to highlight something when I was working many, many, many years ago, we had a situation where Nike was providing the stories and the contractor was building a certain number of stories depending upon the schedule and they were delivering and we were at the same time validating the stories and say, okay, yeah, we're gonna take these stories and that would make part of the build. So has that been, is that an approach that can be worked out you know, more generally in common places? Um, is that a question? Well, yeah, I, I don't want to know how you feel or what, if you have any comments on that. Um, I think if your developer is doing Agile and you're not asking for uh, <clears throat> intermediate um, deliverables for testing, verification, and validation purposes, then it's de facto no different than Waterfall. Correct. So... So the bottom diagram, you know, uh, internally in the organization, sometimes we kind of make up this name Itafall, which is a hybrid of uh, if and waterfall. Uh, this hybrid approach is only a hybrid approach if you in fact get intermediate contractor deliverables to do careful testing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that may seem like a trivial point, but I've seen many uh, contracts where uh, you have this uh, inconsistency between the contracting model and the actual development lifecycle that's being used by your contractor. Uh -huh. and, and it's even worse than waterfall in the sense that you don't have your detailed requirements until very late because your contractors say they're doing iterative or, or agile. So the worst case scenario is very, very late in the development lifecycle, you finally get the detailed requirement against which you define your test scripts for acceptance testing. And that is actually mm -hmm. worse than uh, a waterfall type scenario when you get your detail requirements early on. Now your detail requirement may be inaccurate early on, but at uh -huh. least you have some uh, detail requirements that design careful acceptance test scripts against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, for that particular scenario I'm bringing up, it worked very well. The contractor was, <clears throat> contractor was very happy. They took X number of stories and they worked on those and they brought them back and we validated them. And then they said the next, they took the next set of, of stories. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think for large organizations, you know, in a way management and folks need to be accountable to the money being spent. Um, in addition to better for quality is, uh, or maybe because it's better for quality management, um, there's an added degree of uh, accountability associated with kind of uh, trust but verify as you go along. And, and I think that's, that's really is key is um, uh, you work with your contractor, you want to have a good relationship, but it always needs to be professional and you always need to have this uh, mutual understanding that, uh, uh, that the acquiring organization is going to trust but verify. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yes. So moving on to uh, this uh, term that I actually borrowed from Phil, you know, over the years, he, he he developed uh, this term in his uh, 
uh, business and work of uh, business aware testing. And I really like this term and uh, because it, it, it really means that when people are doing testing, especially acceptance testing, because the organization is going to be uh, using shareholder resources or taxpayer resources uh, to determine if the work done by a contractor is good enough for acceptance. And, and understanding what it meet business needs or not uh, really have two parts, you know, verification, which means is your work product built in accordance with design? And then this uh, even more important concept with the validation, which is, is your work product going to meet business needs? So testing is a complicated thing in large enterprises um, for very large systems. And traditionally, you know, the, the top couple of bullets, you know, with the functional testing and non-functional testing, meaning performance, low and stress testing. Those are, you know, kind of a, a given uh, for all testers and all uh, software QA professionals. Um, in a large enterprise, I think one have to also consider a range of other important aspects of testing. Now, um, for industry that are in a highly regulated uh, climate, or, and then of course within government itself, um, there's going to be a need to assure that uh, um, you know you, you meet all the government required testing. Uh, if a system needs to connect uh, to the IRS, there's a very rigorous uh, testing for a system to connect to the IRS hub, for example. Uh, there may be certification requirements, uh, things of that sort. Um, now, uh, there's often overlooked types of testing. Uh, increasingly, companies are finding the importance of accessibility testing. Society as a whole want to support uh, um, users of IT system better, uh, whether because they have a physical handicap or because, um, you know, there's a need to improve accessibility from a language standpoint or um, cultural sensitivity uh, standpoint. Um, so there is a level of testing. Most uh, federally funded system would require accessibility testing. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that we want our system that handles sensitive information to be secure. Some of these uh, other types of testing often um, an afterthought would be uh, if you're converting a lot of existing data, the integrity of that data conversion needs to be tested. Um, if you are integrating with uh, legacy an existing system of records um, or just existing systems, uh, that integration uh, need to be tested for the robustness of the integration. And then the collective system, the new system together with the legacy and existing system need to support end-to-end -end workflow. And, um, you know, so, so that introduced kind of a range of testing activities that would be needed uh, at different part of the, uh, system development lifecycle, um, well before user acceptance testing, there needs to be a combination of the contractor done testing and perhaps agency uh, or acquiring organization testing that kind of look at intermediate work deliverables. As Bushan said, you know, if you have 50 uh, user stories, maybe you want to make sure that you, every five user story, you start uh, testing them and testing them together uh, to see if there's any issues. By the time you get the UAT, there's a lot of uh, investment in time and effort on the part of the organization. You wanna be sure that the system really is qualified for UAT. And then after UAT, you may still have uh, to have a, a pilot. Doing the pilot is not unusual for a major enterprise to run parallel system to make sure, especially when it comes to system of record, uh, because uh, there's, um, regulatory and, and other ramifications. And you one might need to go through a pilot process to make sure that um, you really are in a position to cut over into full production for all your user community that are to be served by the new system. Uh, what I call the enterprise rollout. All right, um, here's one that almost seems like a common sense, but often not done is 
for these different parts of the development life cycle, there should be pretty well defined exit and entry criteria, uh, entry and exit criteria around system integration testing, user acceptance testing. Now your contractor is gonna say, hey, you know, some of these things kind of fight in the face of agile, to which I would say, your development organization can be as agile as they like, but out of accountability to your own organization and making sure that uh, you spend your shareholders' resources and your uh, taxpayer resources wisely, um, one must go through some formal structured uh, way of uh, looking at testing and its different uh, stages. Classification of defects is the important aspects of UAT because uh, in most situations, until all the defects uh, severity level one and two defects are fixed um, is not going to be accepted. Warranty period will not start. And at that point in time, you're eating into the profit loss of your, um, of your contractor. All right. Uh, this is sort of the empirical trending that's often important in uh, looking at defects. Um, you really want to have a, kind of a a set of test cases that you perform and look at the uh, trend over time. Uh, when there are major releases, you know, one, two, three, four, five may refer to as kind of like uh, uh, engineering releases or, you know, as defects are fixed. Um, you want to be able to empirically observe this, uh, that your defect count has peaked and is coming down. Uh, that turned out to be a very tricky thing to do, especially with large projects. When there's a lot of pressure um, to get through the acceptance testing so the contractor uh, can invoice you. And uh, so, you know, one practice uh, that that large organization might do is they may uh, retain a certain part of the payment for every deliverable. Uh, this retainage, as we call it, is a way to assure that everything gets done in a way that's satisfactory because uh, they're not going to get that um, 10% or 20% retainage. Um, and that, that is a significant part of their profit. So, so that's, that's among the things that one can do uh, to help manage and make sure that the defect level has in fact uh, stabilized before you formally accept the system and enter into a warranty period. All right, uh, this is the last, uh, uh, well, this is a, well, I'm going to talk about seven pillars. So this, this one is about transition to operation. It's often kind of overlooked also is that uh, um, you spend a lot of time, you know, many, many months doing a major enterprise system. At some point, it needs to be operationalized, meaning you're getting very close to the point your contractor is done. Maybe you're getting close to accepting the system. You have to have a plan to make sure that uh, it transition transition well into operation and maintenance. Now that this term operation and maintenance sometimes uh, uh, is called support and maintenance, long-term support, application support. There are many different uh, names for that. Um, but I think, you know, as part of this type of discussion, you know, the basic question really come down to a large enough system with enough users, um, both in the back office and external to your organization, you know, you have to be sure you have your help desk operation ready, you know, the people trained up to support, um, you know, you have your escalation procedures in place uh, in the event of um, system crashes and, and um, severe bugs that are discovered as you, um, you know, as you go uh, in this final phase of your project. And, um, in time, you would have to worry about uh, software patches, uh, bug fixes, and um, um, and the maintenance work may call for certain critical features that were previously overlooked. And um, you know, one of my colleagues in state government is going to be uh, doing a paper at this year's PNSQC on uh, uh, SLA, and um, obviously the service level agreement is going to impact. Uh, your working relationships with your contractor that continue to support and maintain the system. Uh, important ones are, of course, uh, your system availability, um, performance in terms of uh, uh, kind of latency of the system when used by um, 
the number of users that the system may be spec for. Um, then when you have a defect, you know, how much time uh, are you giving your contractor uh, in terms of their response and the ultimate resolution of a defect? And um, data would need to be backed up and all that might need to be done is probably not by your development contractor. It will be part of your own IT shop or third party vendor that may be doing that for you. Um, then you have uh, to worry about, uh, you know, these days increasingly people are using public cloud infrastructure. Um, it may be very important for you to know where your servers, networks and support staff are located because that frequently determine applicable jurisdiction and laws that apply when you are uh, in litigation. So those are very important aspects. Um, and the staff that are involved in supporting the system may need to go through background check, especially when they handle um, uh, sensitive information. And um, there may even be a requirement for um, uh, everything to be based on US soil, uh, especially if it's a US government or state government system. Um, and then most critical system is gonna have to have disaster recovery and the location of your DR, um, the level uh, of DR that you're gonna have, do you have a hot standby, warm standby, all of these things are things that need to be specified and will have a cost. Yang Key, before you continue, uh, Bushan has a question. Yes, please. Bushan, I think you're muted. This couple of slides I had questions on, but but I guess the big question, I or not big question, but one of the questions would be, when you talk about defect severity levels, is there a prior agreement with the contractor? What is level one, level two, level three? How does that get handled in a oh in yeah a situation? Typically, like there's, this? typically there's a specific uh, contractual definition of this severity defects. Um, you know, a step one may, for example, be uh, uh, system crashes. That would definitely be a step one. Right. Um, unable to perform certain important workflow, and the and those workflow has to be predefined. Uh -huh. um, those are among the um, clauses that would need to be in the contract to define uh, the contractual meaning of a severity level. So there's an alignment between the contractor and and the purchaser, I guess. Yeah, and the tricky part, of course, is uh, come down to the splitting of hair, if you may, of uh, um, are you really unable to operate your workflow? Because with enough workaround and out of system human processes, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe many uh, step one defects from the point of view of the acquiring organization your contractor may well, may well want to call a lower SEF level. Right. So, and the ability to have workaround, especially workaround that are not too inconvenient, um, uh -huh. would, would typically be uh, the position of a major contractor in trying to kind of hurry up the process of, uh, of uh, uh, acceptance by reducing the number of SEF 1 and 2 defects to zero. Uh -huh. So, all yeah. right, <clears throat> back to the uh, service level agreement um, discussion. Um, I think the, there's gonna be, have to have good understanding about what happened with unmet SLA. You know, contractor in their best of intention, um, system may still be down a lot and, uh, you're causing business impacts, um, causing your staff time in terms of extra work. Um, um, these things constitute a kind of a liability. Um, so, you know, many contracts may have uh, damage clauses. Um, a lot of time they call liquidated damage. Um, and um, so one has to be very careful uh, watching out for clauses that indemnify the contractor from uh, certain damages that the organization may suffer as a result of a non-operating uh, a system that's not operating properly or completely down. Um, so, so you know, um, having thought through the scenarios, um, 
you know, when SLAs are not met, you know, and even down to the point of, well, how are you going to communicate with your stakeholders and the public? Uh, those are among the work of the business management in thinking through, um, you know, when you have unmet SLA, what are you to do? You know, you may have to now start authorizing a lot of overtime, you know. Um, uh, those are, uh, and then maybe you have to work with uh, your legal and contract people to uh, send out cure letters and um, um, build up kind of an escalation path toward uh, hopefully would never happen, but uh, litigation and and the threat of credible litigation always kind of need to be there uh, when you're dealing in these uh, multi-million dollar contracts or, or even hundred million dollar contracts and bigger. Um, so those are always among the consideration for quality. So other clauses that are important to, to watch out for is uh, increasingly people are concerned about security. Um, there needs to be probably annual security audit to be done by a third party um, for a large enough uh, system contract. Um, and there may be ongoing need for a facility or an IT shop to maintain certain certification. If it's a cloud kind of infrastructure, then it's very important to have, uh, um, you know, look at whether um, say FedRAM might be required. Um, it turns out for um, uh, certain types of data uh, requiring um, a CGIS clearance, um, which is a, uh, a level of clearance required for uh, people's personal uh, identifiable data. Um, I think that that type of, uh, there are situations where, where uh, FedRAM certification may be required uh, for government organizations. Um, so these are among the things that uh, one might need to look at. As far as annual audit, I think um, there are program in the state of Oregon that uh, require the contractor to commission an annual um, uh, security audit firm to perform the audit and uh, the audit pattern and how it needs to uh, connect and cover all the different uh, IT shops. You know, you, you may have a, an organization's own internal IT shop um, and that part of that IT shop responsible for payment processing, uh, you know, may be uh, isolated and need to do additional uh, PCI and other levels of uh, audits. And then if they use public cloud infrastructure, then um, your audit pattern would need to include that, um, you know, um, and then, you know, whether they use uh, infrastructure that's on US soil only and use only US uh, persons in sysadmin, those are among some of the considerations. So this is uh, the last uh, pillar is uh, kind of your readiness of, of your enterprise. Um, now, we all know organization these days, um, when it come to IT, a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the functions are now, you know, uh, outsourced, um, especially when it come to uh, developing the system. You know, the design and development task is uh, almost always outsourced. And then, you know, on this diagram, um, most everything in a large organization's project may well be outsourced. Your system integrator is going to be doing development. They may be doing a data conversion. Uh, if not that same contractor, another contractor may be helping you with the business analysis, defining the roadmap and organizational change toward your new uh, operating model and what kind of business transition you need to go through and then to help you uh, manage the whole thing. Um, now, in order for these things to happen uh, correctly and to leverage the uh, benefits of uh, uh contractor resources, an organization actually needs to have um, kind of its own um, organization when it comes to doing uh, large projects. Um, the red rectangles here can look the, uh, your prime contractor. They are outside of your organization, uh, the project organization, but within your project organization, typically you may have a project manager and, 
And this is the recommendation for the statewide QA program, um, for which I'm the program manager. And I basically recommend that you really have the four functions that you have to think through. You know, you have to have your team that's responsible for the project management. You have your business analysis team that is kind of capturing the requirements, designing the workflow, understanding the gap between the as is and the to be workflows. Um, you have a system team that is uh, helping to define, among other things, what legacy and existing system uh, you need to convert data, you need to uh, handle interfaces and integration. And then of course, that all important uh, team to coordinate the acceptance testing. Um, and then testing as you go along, you know, in terms of the uh, intermediate deliverables for, um, you know, for after some number of iterations, um, you would need to be doing that. So a lot of time an organization just don't have these kind of resources and you may well be using contractor in each of these functions. And then in the case of the, a large organization, you may have a governance, a steering committee of some kind that crosses the function that may be even outside of your uh, immediate organization. Um, and then um, in the case of government projects, often you may have a third party independent contractor, quality assurance contractor, uh, who you must budget for and who must uh, be available to uh, look at uh, work products and management processes. Um, in the state of Oregon, the use of an independent QA contractor is required by statute. And for project over $5 million uh, life cycle cost, independent QA contractor is required. And then there's a test for project between one to $5 million. Yes, Moss. Yeah, I just had a question about this model because it's really, really different than, I, I've worked in um, mostly small and mid-sized com companies. And uh, so we'd have some contractors, but usually we, the team internal to the company would be larger than the contractor uh, that we hire. But I guess in a government, you're, you're, you usually have a, a, a lean internal team and then you have a, a larger contractor that you hire outside. Is that how that works? It is a mix. I think some agency, um, uh, let, let me give you an example. Um, I was connected, I was the project office manager for the state's Medicaid uh, system replacement. Uh, that happened roughly 15 years ago. Um, the state's internal business analysis team was quite large. I mean, there's uh, some 20 people in it. Now, with that said, probably the contractor, which was uh, back then EDS become HP Enterprise, um, they may have even more uh, business analysis uh, folks, but, but the internal team um, is of sufficient size that, uh, and they're not all contractors. Uh, they, they didn't want to use contractor because it's hard to find contractors that is not with your prime contractor that have good detailed understanding of the Medicaid uh, business rules. So, so there is an example. Um, but I think it is true that a lot of time uh, the state's internal team is uh, lean enough and lacking in expertise that uh, frequently you need to pull in, uh, you know, some number of contractors. It's not always the case that your contractor team is bigger than your internal team, um, but it's possible. Um, and testing, I think, is an area that a lot of time is done by um, kind of a BA and business operational staff. Uh, but there's been cases where we retain specific testing contractor that report into the state to conduct uh, the development of test cases and to run uh, the testing um, you know, as part of the acceptance process. A lot of time that firm is maybe the same firm that is providing the BA and the project management. So, so even though it's written functionally as four kind of boxes, it may be just one company that's providing all the resources uh, because um, it's also very complicated to procure, uh, you know, competitively. Uh, and, and if you have projects that's, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for the prime contractor, then these supporting functions for your internal team, uh, the contractor, um, you know, the, the contract size is also of some size, you know, 
Um, to give you an example, you know, uh, that very large project that's in excess of $300 million, the independent quality assurance contract is uh, between six to $8 million. And then there's a variety of contractors that are supporting uh, the internal project management teams. And um, those are all of some uh, sizable expenditures. So I, I think I'm just going to quickly conclude by saying kind of the title uh, of this talk is that uh, there are many facets of uh, quality for enterprise IT. Um, you know, I think it is very important to uh, utilize a good uh, development lifecycle such as agile. Um, but I think from the point of view of an organization acquiring a system um, I think the, maybe the more correct statement is uh, you may encourage your contractor to use agile. Maybe you have no choice but to let your contractor do agile, but imposing well-defined checkpoints um, in a kind of hybrid waterfall, uh, agile kind of, or iterative kind of approach um, may well be necessary, uh, if only for accountability reason and to prevent that scenario I was talking about where you don't have all the detailed requirements until like very, very late in the system development life cycle. And you have very limited time then to develop, uh, even with the help of a contractor, all the pertinent test cases to assure um, that the system is in a state that can be accepted. So, you know, I think um, it's important to remember the contractor really have a different meaning of quality and risk. Uh, I think their goal of course is to uh, enter into a contract, uh, deliver the work products and be able to make a profit. And the organization on the other hand, um, I mean, you want that too, you know, we, we want our contractor um, to make money. Uh, but with that said, you know, um, a project and its management always need to be very keenly aware that there may be inaccuracy with the requirements. Um, there are things that need to be checked over time. And um, this tension between balancing scope creep, which is really the, uh, maybe viewed as the, the negative aspects of scope ex expansion, need to be balanced with the necessary and beneficial uh, changes of scope so your project can actually be successful. So, so I think, you know, Agile and many uh, life cycle methodology um, kind of in this uh, ideal world may assume that you have well-meaning people coming together, contractor, uh, the organization's internal staff, uh, business staff, technical staff, all kind of working harmoniously together. Uh, but I submit that's a very idealistic view of the world. I mean, in practice, uh, your contractor have different motivation than your acquiring organization. Within your acquiring organization, there are folks maybe resistant to change. Uh, among the um, uh, subject matter experts, some may be more uh, of an expert of the as is business process and business requirement than the future target business requirements and processes. Um, so all said, I think, you know, I can boil down um, kind of to that one statement when working with the contractor, especially in these transformative change initiative, uh, it's always important to trust but verify. Um, and that goes not just with the contractor, but also with your internal teams, because um, I think um, all human organizations uh, is susceptible to uh, errors or mistakes. Some come from, um, you know, maybe preventable error and some may be very difficult to prevent because of uh, um, groupthink and maybe certain kinds of systemic uh, biases or uh, in defining the meaning of quality, uh, maybe not the entire community was, uh, that needs to be involved was necessarily involved, you know, as was pointed out earlier, uh, sometimes is very difficult for the business operation to give up its best uh, business analysts because they may be needed for uh, making the day-to-day -day operations work smoothly. So I think 
you know, these challenges is what I think give rise to enormous opportunities for the uh, quality professionals um, that really go well beyond testing. And I think in this sense, I think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, folks interested in uh, kind of enterprise IT quality management and risk management uh, to find uh, kind of many opportunities in many different vertical industries. Uh, each have their own kind of uh, uh, domain of expertise, uh, uh, different kind of specializations. Uh, you know, what you need to know, say in the logistics and transportation industry will be very different than banking and finance, which in turn will be very different than uh, government or education sectors. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, I hope, you know, organization like PNSQC can, uh, uh, you know, provide the kind of resources to help our uh, colleagues uh, to hone in on these skills uh, to uh, really realize a lot of opportunities that are in all the different vertical industries. And, and in key, can I also um, interject that you are uh, on the program committee and you're, you're working to organize the, uh, the I enterprise IT track, is that right? Yes, uh, I, I am very hopeful that, uh, um, you know, by being directly involved in the PNSQC's uh, program committee that uh, we can uh, grow the um, management track to better serve uh, analysts, uh, managers, and, um, you know, folks connected with quality and risk management in, uh, in enterprise IT. Um, and in the sense that it go beyond just uh, development and testing. And, um, um, you know, we have some very good uh, uh, speaker this year. I think earlier I referred to a paper that uh, one of my colleagues will be writing on uh, um, managing uh, service level agreements. Um, you know, we invited the, um, uh, the founder of Puppet Labs to talk about uh, uh, developer productivity and its effect on uh, uh, software quality. And um, we invited uh, Ben Berry, uh, who is the CIO for Airship, to talk about uh, testing and other quality management challenges in uh, um, autonomous uh, um, drones. So I think there's uh, many aspects of uh, software quality in many different industries that uh, offer very, um, you know, robust um, career opportunities and professional development for all that are interested. So if you have any, um, everyone that's here, if you have any friends in IT or if you're in IT and you have a enterprise IT and uh, if you have anybody that you can recommend that might want to um, reach out to Yinki and ask about the program, um, you can message him or send an email to the program committee at pnsqc.org.